This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. When Johannes Brahms played the premiere of his first piano concerto in 1859, he was 26 years old and had the weight of history on his shoulders. Five years earlier, his mentor, Robert Schumann, had written an article in Germany's leading music magazine proclaiming Brahms the future of music, the one fated to give expression to the times in the highest and most ideal manner. End quote. This concerto was his first piece to feature a full orchestra, and the first performance turned out to be a dismal failure. Brahms wrote to his friend Josef Joachim that he knew that, quote, I am only experimenting and feeling my way, but all the same, the hissing was rather too much, end quote. Twenty-two years later, Brahms was one of the most famous composers in Europe, and two symphonies, an epic violin concerto, a requiem, and numerous heartfelt songs and monumental chamber works later, he felt the time was right for another piano concerto. He was a confident composer, sure of his place in music history, and he told his friend Joachim that a second one will sound very different. By this point, Brahms had developed an interesting working pattern. He would spend the winter performing, proofreading works in progress and sketching out new ones, and then do his most concentrated work during the summer, staying in various Austrian or Swiss villages, each for two or three years at a time. In July of 1881, he wrote to a friend that he had finished a tiny, tiny piano concerto with a tiny, tiny wisp of a scherzo, end quote. An understatement that was typical of Brahms' sense of humor, because the final result was anything but tiny. It was also a new kind of piano concerto. For a long time, the popular style for works like this was to have the piano up front as the undisputed star, with the orchestra providing accompaniment. Brahms was more interested in setting up the soloist and orchestra as equal partners, supporting and feeding off each other. The first audiences recognized this. It confused them at first, but it wasn't long before they understood what Brahms was trying to do. The concerto starts with a horn call that seems to come from far away. It's like a call to action for the pianist, who immediately launches into a response that seems to say, OK, here's what I can do. The winds and strings chime in, but they're silenced by another full-blown solo passage from the piano. What this actually is, is the exposition of the first movement, with the orchestra introducing all the primary themes. Starting with an almost martial version of the first theme, but soon introducing a lyrical variation. <laughs> 
the development is majestic. In the midst of it all, though, the horn call drifts in, almost as an afterthought, but it's really the beginning of the recapitulation. Rather than a call and response like the opening, the horn call and the piano's answers are now part of a gentle, continuous flow. Maybe it's because of its place in history, but the overall impression of this concerto is as the quintessential blockbuster. But the expression mark that occurs in the score more often than any other is dolce, sweetly. The year before he started on this concerto, Brahms had written his epic violin concerto for his friend Josef Joachim. He had planned to include a scherzo, an extra fast-paced movement in the middle, but dropped that idea at Joachim's suggestion. He'd already made some sketches for a movement like that after an inspiring trip to Italy, and he decided to include them in this work instead. This is the tiny, tiny wisp of a scherzo he had described to his friend. The music world in the 18th century was overwhelmingly concerned with form. Was it proper to write a symphony with five movements or a concerto with four? Beethoven had had to answer tiresome questions about why there were only two movements in his last piano sonata, and now Brahms was constantly asked to explain the presence of his extra scherzo. He explained that the first movement appeared to him too simple and that he required something strongly passionate before the equally simple andante. Brahms did follow form with a contrasting trio section. Majestic and lyrical variations on the movement's theme Big finish, which almost always brought on a round of applause. The second half of the concerto completely does away with the idea that it might be a blockbuster. No trumpets, no drums, and a slow movement that begins with a long and famous cello solo. Eventually, the cello blends back into the orchestra. But it's interesting to remember that Clara Schumann, who is Robert Schumann's widow, Brahms' mentor and confidant, and the object of his unrequited crush, had scored the slow movement of her own piano concerto for cello and piano alone. <laughs> 
The piano is not really an accompaniment here, but it doesn't try to compete as a singer of that kind of song. It has its own song to sing. There's a famous print of Brahms ambling along, cigar in his mouth, being followed by a red hedgehog, which was the name of his favorite pub. The concerto's finale moves at the same kind of pleasant and not quite fast pace. There's a wistful second theme. A touch of what Brahms would have called gypsy music. flow to the end. This was the last work that Brahms would add to his own repertoire as a performer, and he dedicated it to his longtime teacher, Edward Markson, who'd been a great pianist himself. Brahms had begun studying with Markson when he was just seven years old, and the fact that he took so long to make this formal tribute is significant. Brahms must have felt that he had finally achieved the perfect fusion of inspirational fire with the virtuoso technique he had learned as a child almost half a century earlier. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.